So it, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our uh, first speaker among the faculty speakers. Uh, indeed, uh, Dr. Brian Anthony uh, will be uh, making the first presentation on the topic of uh, personal <coughs> machine uh, and environment and ecosystem. Uh, indeed, looking at a variety of ways of developing sensing technologies. Just as a brief introduction as uh, Brian is uh, setting up. Uh, he's the director of the Master of Engineering and Manufacturing Program. He's a co-director of the Medical Electronic Devices Realization Center. He's a co-lead of the Sense.nano program, indeed the center itself. Um, and indeed, if you uh, look at MIT at large, you can recognize that we have a whole number of Nobel Prizes, but only two Emmy Awards. Uh, and indeed, Dr. Brian Anthony is one of those recipients uh, from the Academy of Television Arts and Science and Broadcast Technical Innovations. But uh, he has done many, many uh, additional works, especially looking at ways of connecting sensing technology to the human body. Uh, indeed, please, Brian, take over and tell us more. Okay. Vladimir, thank you. Um, mic's on? Very good. Um, so I'll, t I'll take the opportunity today to also not only talk a little bit about my work at the end, but to try to do a little bit of additional framing for how I think about Sense.nano. Um, and to reiterate some of the, the concepts both that um, you, you've heard already this morning. Um, so since nano in context, um, we certainly have MIT nano, and I'll, I'll share with you a few slides that of Vladimir's that I won't be able to do justice, but I will attempt to do so, and talk a little bit about this, this, this powering engine that's at the center of campus. Uh, advanced manufacturing. Um, it's a hard thing to put a solid definition on, but there's a lot of innovation happening in advanced processes, uh, material innovations, that are enabling connecting uh, the nanoscale to the macro scale, to the micro scale. Uh, and in this context of uh, this, the pervasive infrastructure of the Internet of Things, big data and the cloud, to try to put uh, Sense.nano in context. So first, uh, as Vladimir said, I think the, the exact day and time is June 7th at 3.47 p.m. or something around there where we get the, get the keys, um, in the heart of campus. All right, so smack dab in the middle, uh, connecting mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemistry, physics, everybody together. So there will be constant friction and movement of people sharing application spaces, sharing domain knowledge across many areas, across the breadth of MIT expertise. It's over 200,000 square feet of space. If you want to innovate at the nanoscale, well, we'll start at the basement, the, the nanoscale imaging. It'll be the, one of the quietest places on the, the eastern seaboard. So. Um, sub-micron, sub-nanometer scale motion of zero uh, radiation interference, acoustic interference. So it'll be very quiet and stable um, in the basement. So we'll do a lot of sensing there. We'll have the tools that allow us to, to image, to measure and sense the nanoscale world. The next two levels um, are going to be very clean. If you start understanding um, Manipulating at the nanoscale, we're talking about the size of chemicals and size of dust particles. So we need to get rid of all that stuff so that we are, are not accidentally putting on the smell of orange or the smell of lemon um, onto the, the nanoparticles or the, the nanoelectronics that we may be fabricating in this center two levels. And on the top floor, if this is all about imaging, it's all about fabrication, the top floor, uh, to oversimplify it in my way, um, is allowing us to then interface the nanoscale world to the macro scale world, or, or the micro and building up to sort of uh, various scales. So maker spaces, sort of a maker space on steroids, but really small, um, that allow us to look at packaging concerns or 3D printing at, at very small scale. Teaching labs. But I think also interestingly, um, President Reif mentioned uh, Katie Stebbins earlier. Um, the state, the Commonwealth, has been very generous in helping to allow us to build an education practice factory uh, on campus. So of something different than a makerspace. A makerspace is, allows you to make a one of something or a two of something where you may not have been as concerned with the cost or, or time associated with making that one of something. But if you want to teach manufacturing, so scale and deal with rate, quality, cost issues, you want to be able to teach flow and, and production at some level appropriate for a university. And so we'll have an, an education and practice factory that has some level of, of packaging capabilities so we can make quantities of hundreds or thousands so we can get production data and be able to teach manufacturing to the entrepreneurs that may not be studying manufacturing, but will be trying to translate into scale product and allow us to better interface with industry. 
So we certainly imagine that the MIT Nano is going to impact everything we do on campus. The, the numbers, I think it's over 50%, both in the School of Engineering and Science, of recently tenured faculty, are doing nanotechnology, nanoscience in some way. So everything from medicine, to engineering, energy systems, computation, is impacting it all. Nanoscale is not new, relatively speaking. Nanoscale has existed forever. So it's the really small stuff. What is new are the tools that allow us to characterize, to manipulate, and to understand phenomena at the nanoscale. And what MIT Nano is going to allow us to do is to provide the facilities and equipment for everybody on campus that want to do nanoscale research, democratize access to the tools necessary to be innovative at that really small scale. And so that's what MIT Nano will provide to us as a community, not only on campus, but for our partners and the, and the community, the ecosystem in which we operate. Okay, so that's one, the MIT, very central context of MIT Nano. So a little bit about advanced manufacturing innovation, not only in uh, the United States and the world, but in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, since 2011, uh, there was an, a, a series of uh, presidential, U.S. presidential inaugurated events that led to a creation of a, a network of manufacturing institutes. In, in Massachusetts, um, there are at least nine of them that have some connection in some way. These are institutes that are funded both from the federal government and state governments and local industry that are intending to fuel connections between academia and industry to innovate in a number of different manufacturing sectors. So three that I'll mention today um, that have strong footprints in Massachusetts are a manufacturing institute that's looking at innovating in the processes and equipment and techniques to produce flexible electronics. So how do we take conventional ICs and put them on flexible substrates for conformal wearing on the body in clothing on equipment? How do we, the other one that's headquartered in, in Cambridge is a FOA, dealing with fibers in fabrics. How do we embed technology, nanoscale, microscale? How do we invent and in, in innovate in the clothing that we've been wearing that hasn't really changed much in, in decades, in hundreds and thousands of years? And the third is in the integrated photonic space, how do we build on top of the semiconductor ecosystem, everything from design tools to production tools to uh, packaging, and simultaneously design for electronic traces and optical traces. Now, not exclusively in all of these are we dealing with sensors, but certainly the overlapping space in all of these are technologies that allow us to either produce sensing technologies to put sensors in innovative form factors, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has a strong role in really emphasizing that advanced sensor space, as we'll hear from Katie Stebbins later today, because this, these three manufacturing institutes, amongst others, are headquartered in Massachusetts, or have significant footprints in Massachusetts. Okay. I won't uh, talk about it too much, but I think we know sort of this, this trend of the Internet of Things, which is uh, maybe what many of you may have thought Sense.Nano was only about, where we have tiny little sensors that are embedded into clothing or into infrastructure, but everything from your Fitbits to your clothing to your plants to your refrigerator, um, sensing technologies that we can produce data, and that goes up into the cloud. The cloud is nothing more than somebody else's computer that you rent time on, so it's, the cloud is somebody else's hardware. But the IoT, big data, and the cloud, that as an ecosystem exists. It's an industry, frankly, that is fundamentally dealing with relatively simple sensors. And there's a need, maybe not this year, but in the next five years, 10 years, for more complex and a rich set of sensing technology to feed into this ecosystem that we're creating to deal with these simple sensors that exist now. And then there's the MIT context. As Vladimir mentioned, the, the bench at MIT is pretty deep. We put together 12 speakers today um, from MIT. But if you go to sense.mit.edu slash people, not an exhaustive list, there's a, a start of the compilation of people that have been doing sense sensors, sensing related system work over the last couple of years. These are people that have had MIT news stories um, that are engaged in the sense.nano nano community. Um, What's interesting, though, is sensing does not sit in electrical engineering, does not sit in mechanical engineering, does not sit in physics, it does not sit in chemistry, it sits at MIT. 
as engineers and scientists, so if, I were, if I were to say oversimplify, it part and parcel for what we do. We measure, we sense things. We are either using sensors or making sensors. Um, and it spans from basic research, basic sensing science, to instrumentation that is trying to image, trying to understand and characterize at the nanoscale, to the sensors and sensing control systems that you may need for advanced manufacturing, to control manufacturing processes. So the dynamic range of expertise within MIT, within sense.nano, spans from the fundamental applied, from the fundamental basic research to applied to that early scale up. So as we look at connecting the community at MIT together, we have that range of expertise and there's a great impedance match with the industrial partners that are in the room today. Now, just picking a, a couple uh, examples for, of people that could not be here today. Um, to give you a, a flavor of the span of what sense.nano can be and should be. Certainly the sensors. So this is a, a, a screenshot uh, from Wojciech Matuczyk um, looking at a, uh, a sensor that changes color uh, when there's a pressure applied to it. So the application space being human machine interfaces and in, in understanding contact between man and machine. Uh, over here, uh, we have some work from Kamal Yusuf Tumi that is a, a high speed atomic force microscope that allows us to image chemical processes at thousands of frames per second. So we don't just get a snapshot of a chemical at nanoscale, but we can see the chemicals moving around at a rate to understand the dynamics of what's happening. And Sangeet Tabatia, who her approach to sensing here is not a sensor, but a, a a nanoparticle, a nanosensor that is, goes into the body, is magnetically activated. After it's magnetically activated, will chemically react with tumor cells in the body, which are then passed out through urine, and then can be characterized. So we have sort of this breadth in sense. Sensors, sensing systems, and sensing techniques. Okay. So I think I said these things. Um, sensing. Insight into the condition of the world, from person to machine, built environment, natural environment, building on top of manufacturing capabilities, data science infrastructure, and the nanoscience and nanotechnology that MIT Nano will enable. And we know, as I talked to our, our big data colleagues, and I'm not um, disparaging that community at all, but the sensors that they're using now are simple. And our opportunity is to make that data input a much more complex and, and rigorous and, and rich future. So the application space that we envision for sense.nano, sensors, sensing systems, sensing techniques, person and machine, environment and ecosystem. And I'll tell you one story in the time that I have a lot, um, remaining that is my group's research or things that we do collaboratively on campus that weave some of these things together. Um, Matthew Gilbertson and Athena Huang in my group um, have developed in the past a ultrasound, trying to understand the characteristics of using ultrasound. How do we make ultrasound more usable, more quantifiable? So this is a, an ultrasound probe, a commercially available ultrasound probe that we've mounted a clamshell, a 3D printed clamshell around it uh, through a force sensor. And we image here either the carotid artery or the brachial artery. And how hard we're pressing on the body impacts what we see. So here we see the brachial artery under one newton of load, under three newtons of load, and under five newtons of load. So we're pressing on the body as we put sound into the body, get reflections from interfaces in the body, and receive that and construct an image. Now, if we were to acquire a sequence of imagery on the carotid artery, where two things are going on in this video. One is blood pressure, is your, your heart is pulsing. We're going through peak to systole, diastole, and there's a, a, a sort of a flow of blood going pulse, 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 and we see that pulsing of the artery. At the same time, the patient, the volunteer in this case, is taking this ultrasound probe and pressing it a little bit onto their artery. So they're applying a load from the outside of the body, and the inside of the body is applying a load on the artery. So we have this sort of complex tissue that's moving around that's under load from blood pressure and under load because the ultrasound probe at the, very, at the surface is being pressed on to the body. So what can we do with this? We can actually treat this complex arrangement of tissue as a spring. And we can estimate 
the mechanical properties of this tissue, we can estimate the mechanical properties of the artery, and we can estimate the internal pressure. So Aaron Zakrzewski, Zakrzewski, who just graduated, who just finished his PhD, his effort was understanding how to use this force correlated data to estimate blood pressure. So some just screenshots, this is sort of the carotid artery at two newtons, seven newtons, and 12 newtons. A simple mechanical model that can take a lot of computation to take this input of image data, force data, and estimate what were the mechanical properties that had to be true to explain those observations, and has had some phenomenal successes in correlating those results. So this is results on a hypertensive patient measured over a two-month time period, where the solid lines are Aaron's algorithmic results correlating imagery and force with a blood pressure cuff. And so we have about 5% error compared to the blood pressure cuff currently. It's the only technique that we're aware of that also is a, a calibration-free approach to uh, measuring blood pressure. Doesn't re we have, our, as our fundamental calibration, a measure of force at the interface between the, the patient and this handheld ultrasound probe. So we've had NIH funding um, over the last couple of years to develop this handheld thing, uh, something that looks very different than an ultrasound system that you would find in the hospital, but is instead a little device that would sit in your night st nightstand or uh, in your restroom, and you pick it up, just touch to your carotid, and in 10 seconds, you get a measure of your blood pressure, which agrees quite nicely with what you would get with the blood pressure cuff. But the question is, how do we take what we've done and turn it in? Can we turn it into a wearable ultrasound blood pressure sensor where it's just a little patch on the skin instead of this you know, now miniaturized but handheld device? So we need a way to analyze the data. We've done that. We need a reliable, realizable, realizable cost-appropriate wearable design. And we need a manufacturing process um, that would allow us to make that design. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Um, in collaboration with Vladimir's group, um, so Megan and Aporva, uh, graduate students, have been really building on top of technology where they've been looking at creating flexible MEMS for acoustic range, so for speakers, and changing this structure of little MEMS pressure sensors on a flexible array to produce acoustic sound to producing ultrasound. So little speakers, tiny little speakers distributed over a flexible array. So that's the notion. They've successfully created a prototype device doing hand predominantly hand fabrication. This is gold foil. You see some wrinkles there, so we're not, we're not quite perfect yet. And we see some zoomed in uh, micrographs of the gold foil over these little membranes. And we have our, our, our data. We actually are getting now signal. We have sort of at the megahertz range a, an amplitude that should be sufficient to both insert sound into the body and receive it. We don't need image quality. We're not trying to actually create an image in the end. We just need to use ultrasound in a non-destructive testing way to get sufficient data to be able to get the signal to estimate this blood pressure. So we're on our way to having a device design. Well, we can't make this by hand. We can't tolerate these wrinkles. So along with Dave Hart and Jean Du, the manufacturing side of this is, well, let's look at taking roll-to-roll -roll printing, where we have uh, roll handlers, roll handlers, um, a lot of cameras and techniques to visualize the roll a print head that allows us to make inking onto the substrate to produce those little micro oil structures. Now, instead of a on top of silicon by hand, to do it on a roll-to-roll, -roll, low-cost, uh, potentially disposable, flexible substrate. Um, so this is just a, a graphic um, that talks a little bit about the machinery um, and the impression cylinder and the, plat the print platform of how we would actually make that pattern and structure on a flexible substrate. Now, as it turns out, in the sort of two minutes that I have remaining. Um, the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenge, challenges for this is in the sensing, the sensing for process control. We need to be able to make sure that we have good contact between the roller and the substrate. We need to make sure that as this is a deformable, stretchable web, that we're not deforming it too much or that we're controlling the deformation in a way that we want. And the pattern that we get is the pattern that we want. So there's a lot of required sensing in understanding how to control these processes. So I just want to tell you a little bit of story from a, a handheld blood pressure device to a, a, a nanoscale enabled uh, patch
to the manufacturing techniques that would be required. Again, reflecting this breadth from the basic to the uh, applied and scale up that we have on campus. Now back to this, person to machine, environment and ecosystem. Today, you're gonna hear um, not only for myself, but a handful of people that talk about various aspects of this. Diagnostics, forest, bridges, water, the potential applications within Sense.Nano. My proof, my one mathematical equation for today is, you know, all this comes together. MIT Nano plus advanced manufacturing, the Internet of Things, big data in the cloud, plus all the sense-related research on campus leads us to this unique opportunity to really be a powerful community on campus and engaging with our community in Sense.Nano. And what we're here today is just the start. What are the things that we should be focusing on? What are the grand challenges that are pre-competitive and that require us to do multi-collaborations with multiple companies? What are the things that are most beneficial to um, the various ecosystems? How do we work together to do this? So we want your input. We want you to be on the Sense family tree if you go to sense.mit.edu. Um, I welcome your, your questions um, throughout the day. Um, and I want to specifically thank the folks whose research that I reflected today. Um, and with that, uh, I again welcome you to the, today. And I'm not going to take any questions because we're going to convene after each segment of three speakers into a small panel. So thank you.